talk about her book, Diversity. I think it's, tell me about it. What's it called, Benny? It's called A Little Guide for Teachers, Diversity in Schools. It's quite a mouthful for a tiny book. And it is a tiny book, you tell me. It is. It it's a tiny book. I can hold it up, actually. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, I think my, it's, it's not much bigger than my face. So, um, yeah, it's only 104 pages long. Um, it can be read in, in one sitting. And, and that's what it's designed for. Busy teachers um, dipping in and out of something. And dipping in and out is useful to have on the shelf because you can keep going back to it. In other words, it's not just a one off read. No, definitely not. Um, and because it's split into quite distinct sections, um, it allows you to kind of move. You don't have to have read the beginning to have read the end, to read the end. It's it's very much kind of standalone parts of, of, of a book. Um, and there's been lots of positive feedback about the fact that it's quite practical. Um, you know, the whole intent behind it was I'm a working teacher. I, I want practical ideas that I can apply tomorrow. And the fact that people have said, you know, well, look, I've read your book and this is what I'm going to do in my classroom with my students immediately. I think that's really that's that's the purpose of it. Um, so that feels quite good. And you're a working teacher in these COVID times, which um, must be, well, strenuous to say the least you're deputy head teaching and learning at a school in derby and you're also in charge of curriculum tell me how how's it been are you mainly online or do you go into school or, or what so i am going into school um our teaching is very much a mixed model um we've uh, a population uh, around us that has very limited access to resources and um, so we've had to really bespoke an, an approach uh, to the children in front of us and our teachers have been fabulous at trying to get uh, paper packs ready which we're delivering um, we've got drop-off points in the community and pick-up points in the community um, and my colleagues have been visiting students and making sure they've got laptops um, so it, it is strenuous but in some ways the team has been absolutely fantastic uh, to make sure our kids can get uh, something of the provision that some of their peers might be getting across across the country. Do you find that um, online teaching um, is is wearing? A lot of teachers are saying it's it's makes them more tired being uh, online teaching, not, yeah. teaching in schools, and that's saying something because uh, teaching in schools is quite tiring in itself. It is. I think you know from speaking to the teams um, at school, it's a different kind of tired. Um, people have said, you know, look, actually, my eyes hurt. I've got a headache, um, and it and it is quite exhausting. That kind of intensity of looking at the screen and managing those silences. Um, and you know, we haven't been doing loads of live lessons because of the lack of access for our students, and we're we're starting to roll that out. But you know, where they have trialed uh, the live lessons, people have said, God. That was, that was actually really tiring so how some teachers are doing five live lessons a day I just you know it's incredible and that but that's a testament to the, the profession I think people are incredibly adaptable and, and they will do anything for the students and this the other thing of course is the poor student who's sat there staring at the screen all day without a break trying to concentrate and focus it might it's probably more difficult for them as well I would have thought um certainly the you know uh teachers uh, uh, my colleagues who've got children say uh, you know this isn't a sustainable model because they're sat in front of a screen all day and that's not healthy for our for our children they need a break and and they've really appreciated where lessons have been sort of 20 minutes of pre-recorded material with some activities and plenty of breaks during the day um and but at the moment, you know, you can't criticise any system because we're all doing what we can and it's trial and error uh, until a vaccination, I imagine. Um, so that's the thing. And, you know, I'm never going to sit here and criticise it um, because people do what they can with what they have. Um, but, yeah, I wouldn't want any child of mine to be sat in front of a screen that long. And concentrating and focusing on live lessons all the time. It, it's getting that balance right. I mean, from my own experience yeah. as a parent, um, certainly having a mixed a mixed economy. It's good to have the teachers dropping in to keep you on your toes, keep things going, to keep that contact with the kid mm -hmm. going as well. And you can obviously see how they are and, and those sort of, you know, looking after their welfare and as well yeah. as part of it. But if every lesson was completely live all the time, all day long, I think that that becomes a problem as well. 
Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the practicalities of it are, are also something to consider. So, you know, you've got if you've got three children and they're all doing live lessons that you, you need three devices uh, to make that happen, to have that parity of access. And, you know, you need the bandwidth and you need the space in a, in a, in a, in a room, in a house. And not all of our children have that. So that mixed economy, you're right, is absolutely vital. You've got a, a real need to um kind of chunk it down um and to timetable it appropriately um for the children yeah yeah and try and keep contact with the parents as well if if anything's concerning perhaps because it's easier yeah. for a child to say they've done the work <laughs> yeah. but if you haven't got the direct contact with the school saying well actually it's not being done or or, or mm -hmm. you know there is an issue here with the quality of it i mean mm -hmm. not surprisingly or or do we just hope for the best and then when they come back we then try and do catch up or whatever a, a mm. way of expressing it might be. Well, certainly my approach has been, you know, we've been doing a lot of quality assurance of what's been going out to the students either via online um, platforms or in the paper packs. And um, for us, you know, it's closing the loop. So, yes, you're setting the work. But is there enough dialogue about kind of submitting and then feedback? Because that's what children will miss. They'll miss their teacher's input. Um, and then you, you kind of really distinguishing between work that is um, aligned to your sequences of work, aligned to your schemes of work, um, and not just sort of extended cover work. Um, and, and that's something that we've been really conscious of to try and stick to. Uh, the curriculum as far as possible so that when we do get them back that there is some chance there's a you know there's a, a chance in hell that they can get back on track quicker than if you sort of bundled things together without thought what's the age group you teach there so we're in all three school um so three to 18 but i'm based at the secondary and i'm a secondary specialist however i have learned a lot about primary in the last couple of years and it's fascinating and and actually seeing the resilience of the children from you know a very young age um all the way up to our sixth formers um that's been incredible you know our primary kids uh, i always say they bounce they they are incredible incredibly adapted to whatever's going on around them um and the primary has, has been a really pleasant environment for them, for those who are actually in school. Now, if you teach that hugely, hugely wide age gap, I mean, three to 18, extraordinary, really, isn't it? I'm seeing them go through from childhood to adulthood, hugely, I should think. Um, quite an extraordinary experience. Could you tell me one thing? Exams are screwed up. We know that. And this year <laughs> yeah. they're screwed up. But what I'm interested in is next year's exams. Mm. how's that going to go do you think there's going to be issues there or do you think everything can go back to normal i think normal is a word that i have trouble with anyway um the knock-on effects of the what's happening now that ripple effect is going to cross years and you know we're talking about um year 11 um and actually it's not just about year 11 it's about our year 10s and our year nines as well and we've got such a lot of work to do around how to ensure that children are back on track to be able to do exams in some way shape or form you know exams are a leveler um i don't think they're perfect but i certainly think that they are important to eradicate kind of biases in our system um so yes i, I want the exams to be back i think the current situation where you know we've got a consultation coming um and it's all up in the air that uncertainty is really unsettling for students who are being told on one hand that they might be cancelled uh they might be on um and so it becomes very difficult to stay motivated under those circumstances yeah i'm, I'm really interested in what you said there about because this is one of the issues people have with teacher assessment mm. and that is the unconscious or conscious even sometimes bias of a teacher towards a pupil um and can yeah. they can they examine fairly now of course they will want to yeah but can they i think it's a really tough one you know i believe in the integrity of our teachers i believe in the integrity of the profession and you know we all go in knowing that um when we assess our students that there are there are all sorts of factors that might influence 
that particular grade and no one goes in with the intention of giving one child more a, a better grade than another um but it's very hard you know you have your favorites you have the ones that you know you know what they meant so you know you give them the mark it's very hard to take your relationship out of um giving a mark to a child and I think that you know with with the exams some of that is taken away i still think there are um you know biases within the exam system some of the papers themselves are very uh, specific in terms of cultural experiences and it's not necessarily just about culture either when you think about the class difference and the experiences of different uh, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds and whether an exam paper can fully reflect uh, the experiences of a, a working class child compared to a child from a, a wealthy background, um, actually there's there's inherent flaws in, in an exam system. So we're never going to get to perfect. And in, in this climate, I think for me, the most important thing is clarity from our glorious leaders about what is happening, why it's happening and how we're going to make it fair as opposed to leaked um, memos and, and speculation. I thought for a minute there you were saying glorious leaders without any irony, but I think I did. Oh, it them out of, <laughs> might have been slight, slight amount of irony there. This, this of course, brings us into your themes of your book um, about diversity. I'm, I'm just taking some notes here earlier mm -hmm. um, in classroom, curriculum, and school. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about class in classroom as well, of course, there, but also race, also gender. Um, you tell me what what what's what's diversity to you? Um, to me, it's about the protected characteristics, and I think you know the the risk with some of the recent narratives around equality and diversity is that we narrow diversity down to just being about race um, and culture and religion. And actually, for me and for our students, you know, our students are um, a multitude of characteristics. Some of them have uh, intersectional identities, so they may have a disability and uh, be Asian. They may be. Um, um, a transgender child and um, have um, you know be a person of color and and so there's all sorts of these overlaps and when you think about diversity um, it's really about creating a sense of equity and understanding that there are different starting points for different people and and as teachers actually we are naturally aligned to that process when we think about our classroom spaces we'll say well that child came in on a uh, you know a, a standardized score of 90 therefore you know we want them to make this amount of progress and we're going to be ambitious about it and, and we're going to put the steps in place to be able to support them um, and diversity in schools is is very similar to that. It's just an extension of what we do with progress and attainment. Um, where we've got a child who has struggle who struggles accessing um, because of uh, a multitude of reasons, um, an equitable process for them teachers knowing the the kind of things they need to do to be able to support a child. That's what I feel like diversity really means. Um, um, and I, I don't think we can overcomplicate it either. Okay, I mean, is that a sort of way? I'm, I, I don't know quite how to phrase it. I think personalised would be the, the nearest word I could think of, but it's personalised rather than to the individual, but to um, where they are in the intersection, perhaps. Is that? Yeah, I mean, there's no, uh, I don't think there's a, a kind of, template that you can use. I think there are things that you can do to mitigate for um, those intersections and um, for the barriers that come around come about because of some of those protected characteristics. Um, you know, you, you mitigate for disability, you can't solve that problem, but you put in steps to, tr to try and uh, alleviate any um, uh, 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 any uh, lack of access uh, that child might have um so yeah absolutely uh, you know when we look at creating a school um that is diverse inclusive equitable it's recognizing that actually one size fits all for all of the students doesn't always work um and that we might actually be exacerbating gaps in uh, attainment and progress, uh, gaps in our society on a, on a broader scale by erasing some of the, the personalised needs that these students have. Okay, now I can see it in the classroom and all, all those things. So, I mean, obvious things like ramps, 
um, yes. teach, um, <laughs> someone who's who's hard of hearing, having you know um, a connection to the teacher. I, I forgot mm -hmm. what those things are called. Where they wear, wear in the neck. What is it called? I think they're called audio loops, aren't they? Audio. That's the word. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one. Audio loops, things like that. Um, you know, basic things that um, lifts. You know, all, all these things that people can easily mm. say oh yeah that that sounds like a good idea and all that so that's around the school mm -hmm. people get a bit more hot under the collar i suppose when it comes to curriculum yes um and curriculum content and and rather than just the way it's taught but but one thing uh, there's the balance between the culture with a big c mm -hmm. and the child and some people take personalization to a child centered point we follow the child their interests what they you know all mm -hmm. their experiences and follow them others are more big c high well big c high culture that's good isn't it big h and yeah. z high culture <laughs> it's over there this is the important thing that that child needs to learn how do you do you do you balance those or do you ignore one more than the other i mean how what do you think about that as a, as a you know as part of the debate so i mean for me uh i think some of the myths some of the fallacies around curriculum and identity just need to be addressed to start with uh, no one i think is saying look actually we should uh, let the children decide what's in the curriculum and just because we have black or asian students in a classroom means that we have black or asian texts um you know there's there's arguments for better representation amongst you know kind of curriculum content but for me this has always been about um, not adding in tokenistic gestures of, you know, well, we've got this child, so we've got a disabled child in our class, so that I'm going to have a, a text with a, a, a character with a disability. I think that's kind of that bolt-on approach that it's it's almost fetishistic. It's not it's not helpful. Um, for me, it's always been about usualizing, and it's a term I use very carefully, a term coined by Sue Sanders, um, the experiences of what are people who are considered other. Um, in, in in our kind of context um, so you know you see the kind of inclusion to references to disability to sexuality to gender uh, to race um, in a positive celebrated way uh, and not just in terms of Black History Month or LGBTQ History Month you see it woven into the curriculum um, and that might be look you know I'm doing um, A Midsummer Night's Dream and we've got a reference to the little Indian boy. Uh, how is that relevant? Why is that relevant? Well, actually, the little Indian boy is a kind of little um, uh, a metaphor for some of the colonial activity that was going on at the time, it has been said. And so there's ways into talking about diversity and content without going, right, now we're going to have a whole unit of work on on um, on Asian literature. Um, and I think, you know, kind of reinventing things doesn't necessarily work. Um, and the other idea is that, you know, you you acknowledge the migration points of, um, of the culture that we have in this country. So, you know, our texts, our art, our music, um, has those ideas have uh, are connected and have been connected to cultures across the globe. Um, and everything we have here today is a product of ideas that have moved from different places. Um, and I think if we can work towards a curriculum that acknowledges that, that's when we talk about decentering the narrative, um, decolonizing, if if that's the word that you want to use. Um, because it's acknowledging that yes, we live here and this is the culture that we that we function in, but that everybody has contributed to that. There's a fabric of society and, and we are part of that narrative. And culture, of course, is a changing feast, should we say it's changing all the time. But to to give this a bit of context, I mean your own experience as a as a student, as as well as a teacher, as as someone living in Derby. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what, how, how is your own experience um, reflected in your thinking, do you think? So, I mean, I've spoken quite openly. I spoke at uh, the Team English National Conference about my experience of literature as a child. And, it, you know, it, I, was, it wasn't, I wasn't hard done by as a child. I, you know, I didn't recognise what was missing um, in representation in, in literature as a child. It was only after, it was only after I grew up and, and 
started to become conscious of some of these narratives around who I am, whether I appear in some of these texts and, and that feeling of devastation that I actually know I wouldn't, I'd be, I'd be the exotic anomaly in the corner. Um, that, that was always the problem. Um, you know, we didn't talk about diversity. We didn't talk, we, there was no reference to inclusion and my curriculum was very limited as a child. Um, and actually, that's a failure of kind of subject knowledge on the part of you know the curriculum that I was I was offered. My kind of experience is that if you're providing a really rich uh, knowledge rich curriculum, a really deep knowledge rich curriculum, it should include some of those references from around uh, different cultures. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think I was uh, oppressed as a child. I had a very good education, but it was sad to to realise that. I didn't know very much about my own culture and my parents you know, could argue it's a, it's a family's uh, responsibility but my parents aren't academics you know they had a very limited understanding it was all anecdotal um, so to learn about you know great Indian literature I didn't do that until I was much much uh, older and it was certainly off my own back um, so yeah I guess in, in some ways that's really shaped my thinking about curriculum work. It's interesting what you say about your own culture. Can you can you delve into that a bit further? It, yeah. it, it, what is one's own culture? And I say ones to to broaden it out from just yourself, perhaps. But well, we can start. With, well, well, we can start with myself. You know, I'm, I'm a product of lots of different places. Um, my uh, family, my my mother, my father, their parents were all um, born in East Africa. Uh, so they were East African Asian, I guess. Um, they're part, part of the Indian diaspora, so moved from the Gujarat in the early 20, 20th century. And, and actually that kind of history in itself is very limited because there's, there's not been very much written down about it. So learning about the, the history of my own family has been a challenge. Um, and, and, and I guess that would present a challenge for, for any teacher to try and kind of teach that history as well, because it simply doesn't exist and, uh, in, in any kind of um, easily accessible form. But when we talk about own cultures, you know, like I bring to um, the discourse, the knowledge of stories and myths and uh, music and art that I was exposed to at home um, and I wanted to be able to know how that fits within the British narrative is it related is it um, is there any connection you know or are these two entirely separate uh, streams of thought and you know, to be able to make those connections for a child and say, look, actually, you know, you have this and we have this. Why is there a similarity? Um, you know, what is it about our cultures? Why is there a, a crossover? The best example I had of this is, is teaching um, origin stories um, and then going on to talk about um, the Odyssey and the Epic of uh, Gilgamesh. And students, because, because I gave them lots of examples from uh, around the globe of kind of origin stories, different cultures, they started to pick out those commonalities. Like, okay, there's a reference to floods. You know, why is the apple or the pomegranate so important? Why does that come up as a motif constantly? And that kind of, they were bringing, well, actually, there's a story in my culture about this. There's a story of, you know, I, I've read this before. My mum told me a story. That space needs to be made and because it enriches the discussion about English literature and because I'm an English teacher, it's it's my first port of call. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Again, I mean the fact we're even discussing this, is this othering? Is this, you know, uh, I as a white man thinking, right, well, this is exotic she's got this interesting background should we should we discuss this in any way well i have been called exotic uh, yeah. before i'm not sure it's an accurate descriptor martin um <laughs> so i'm very much i was born in leicester so it's like not that exotic um but uh, there's a difference between kind of othering and recognizing and seeing and i think you know the other the othering with a capital o is very much an active uh, process which is you know us versus them i don't there's, there's that barrier up um between yourself and, and someone who is different from you um you know to be able to celebrate and uh, the the contributions of a person's identity within a the society that we live in that's not othering that's making them part of the narrative and and i think that's that's the the core aim of this that where you make people feel like they belong that our sense of social cohesion improves um and then you don't get that kind of tribalism that 
perhaps you know it's anecdotal but you know you see a very tribalistic approach um becoming quite popular these days and maybe as teachers we're we're here to mitigate for that yeah and it's it's interesting as well of course because there's diversity of identity but there's also diversity of opinion and the free speech um people who get on the barricades about this are very strong on this but I, I think there's there's a lot to be said for diversity of opinion the trouble is then of course is how inclusive do you want to be i mean where do you draw the line at a, a trump voter for example or someone storming the barricades of the capital or trump himself or rudy giuliani where do you draw the line on on diversity of opinion uh, it's, a, it's a really tricky one and I don't think that anyone has solved it there are probably thinkers far more intelligent than me that have got answers to this but I think for me the rule that I live by is that you know your right to swing your fist ends when it hits my face um, and when we're thinking about free speech and, and where our lines are that you're allowed to say what you want to say um, and but you've got to be careful about the consequence you've got to be aware of the consequences of that and and, and perhaps mitigate for in, in what you're saying for those consequences um, I don't I'm not a big fan of censorship. Um, I, I do feel like, you know, that kind of breeds resentment. Um, but I do believe that, you know, you're allowed to have differences of opinion. And I think and in many ways, we've forgotten how to have differences of, of opinion in a very civil way. You know, you, uh, I often talk about the the ochlocracy of Twitter, uh, the mob rule of Twitter um, and the fact that, you know, people feel like they can say what they like uh, and they're not always aware of what the consequences of, of that will be. Um, but yeah, I welcome a, di a diversity of opinion. I don't have to accept it. Uh, I don't have to respond to it. And I think in some ways you stay sane that way. And in terms of the word decolonizing, now you used it as you came to it rather than started with it. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's a word that does get, and we're talking about diversity of opinion here, does get certain people's backs up. Uh, well, you can see that, you know, you, uh, <laughs> the moment you start talking about decolonization, there's, I think there are lots of myths attached to the word. And, you know, it's a, it's an academic discipline. And I've been very honest and open and said, I have not, I don't have a background in decolonization um you know I've, I've never done a degree level work on that kind of thing I'm a, a student of literature so I never claim to be you know decolonizing the curriculum I talk about decentering a lot I talk about kind of um connections and, and and migrations of ideas um I think I'd be you know doing it a disservice if I said I was actively decolonizing um I have a lot more work to do to learn what that word means. And I think that's part of the issue that people will react to the word without having gone and looked at what it means. Um, and perhaps that comes from this idea that, uh, or the myth that just because you're talking about decolonization doesn't mean that you can't see the, the positives of British culture. Um, and, you know, it, it's an all or nothing uh, situation you know if you're decolonizing you must hate us well that well that's not true um it's far more nuanced than that yeah so decentering decolonizing is, is it because there's a, a difference of opinion about what decolonizing itself is means in those who who think it's an important thing perhaps no, not necessarily. You know, I think people who have done the work around this have got really clear definitions of what it means. And there are some incredible bits of work and incredible um, organisations that um, are talking about this on a regular basis. But I think, you know, where it's bandied about on Twitter and on social media and on Facebook, you know, you get you get a real kind of um, a, a uninformed approach to it. Um, and that's why I, I'm very careful to say, look, when I say the word decolonizing, I mean it with a small d because I'm not qualified to speak to it in the way that I, I could if I'd done more work around it. Um, but no, I don't think there's any confusion about what it means. Um, I think there are perceptions of what it means from people who haven't done the work. Um, and then you end up in that situation where you're educating and you're saying, well, actually, have you looked at this? Have you looked at that? Um, and people can either choose to go down that path or they can entrench themselves in this idea that it's an us versus them situation. And I, that's why I often say, you know, my first reaction isn't the reaction that I will have in 10 minutes time when I've thought, is there any truth in this? Um, and, and sometimes it, it's hard to acknowledge that there might be some truth in something that you instinctively disagree with. Um, but 
I was always taught where where there is criticism, find the truth in it and work work with that. Yeah, that's that's a, a good, a good certainly a good adage. Um, in terms of curriculum content mm -hmm. and following what you think and following, you know, how how much do you believe in a national curriculum? Um, again, it's a leveler in some ways. I think that the iteration we have of the national curriculum now perhaps isn't as representative as it could be, um, and 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 actually isn't evolving in the in the same way as our society is evolving. Um, I think something that's more of a live document where you know you have suggestions and um, developments as the years go on I think would be a far more useful document than the static version that we have at the moment um, you know codifying anything is a problem because people will either follow things to the rules or reject or adapt and and then you've got a situation where you well who does this apply to and and do we have that parity of experience for all of our children anyway um so i'm not averse to the idea of a national curriculum i just would want it to be far more um adaptive you know ad adaptable as we go along okay i'm gonna throw a quote which is sitting over my face at the moment now from... <laughs> it is sitting over your face yes it is yeah <laughs> you can see it though hopefully you can see it um, I, I'm interested in this generally because it talks about culture ultimately ensuring the preservation and continuity of a people. Mm -hmm. And yet further on, then it talks about challenging culture and about having space to challenge it. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be some sort of conflict between those two things. In other words, people who want things to stay the same mm -hmm. and people who want it to change in order to include them. And yeah. to me, this this is part of the dichotomy that we've had um, when we talk about um, culture generally. I don't know what right. your, your thoughts generally are about about that. So I tend not to think in binary. Um, you know, it, it's not a one or the other situation. I think, you know, culture there's an element of things that are fixed in culture that are traditional that are the way um things have always been done but we know that in reality that cultures have shifted and adapted with the times and so yes that conflict is there but that is a natural result of the fact that we are moving on as people um, and that we've got different ideas and that we're developing as a people um so I, i'm not surprised that there's a conflict um you know you want to be able to preserve the best bits of a culture um but you have to be able to challenge the bits that are um, not reflective of the society we live in these days. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with challenging parts of a culture um, that perhaps need to, to, to move forward. I have to say it's the preserve of the people within that culture to do that. Um, and, you know, it, you throw up all sorts of issues when we start saying, well, actually, your culture needs to move on. I don't, I don't think that's appropriate. Um, but if somebody within a culture says, you look, you know, I, I understand the need to have that continuity, but I also see that that, that there is a need to make some changes. I think that's a legitimate thought process, and and, and I think it's a common thought process. And it, it's an interesting thing there about being in that culture, about where that border is drawn. I mean, borders are, are fascinating things. Um, I, I first came across this sort of theory as a cultural studies student reading Raymond Williams about border country and the importance mm -hmm. of going across a border and how you could be the same or different in different environments and he tends to think well i'm different when i'm there i'm different when i'm in wales <laughs> you know when i'm in cambridge i'm a different person almost mm -hmm. i mean do we cross traverse borders or do we do we carry the same baggage wherever we go do we change do we move are we chameleon like how does it work uh, I think probably all of those, you know, it, it's very hard to define the impact of a border on a person. And, you know, we're talking about physical movement, if, you know, physical movement. If I go from uh, sitting here in Derby to, to sitting in the south of France, you know, I'm a different person there because it's different circumstances and I adapt to the culture that I'm in. Um, but I also bring my own experiences and my own understanding of, of uh, life and society uh, to that. Um, I think when we start to think of borders as really fixed and as cultures is really fixed that's when it becomes problematic because it becomes well this is my space 
Okay, you come into my space, and now you are saying that you you're bringing your own uh, input into that. And well, no, I've drawn this border; it, it, it's my space. Um, and I'm sure we could wax lyrical about the the issues of drawing borders uh, in communities where you know that's led to conflict later on. And I think again that that defining of the space as mine or yours um, with your culture there and my culture here, that leads to all sorts of issues. And, and, and it's a very uncomfortable place to be. It's something that, of course, lots of people are experiencing at the moment because, I mean, the culture which they're most in charge of, you like, if, if is the one beyond the garden gate, let's say, you know, here's, this is my culture, it's my house. And yet, when you're there 24-7 with your family, <laughs> it's an interesting conflict sort of arise there. Yep. <laughs> the culture of age, of, of, of likes, dislikes, of who, what's going to be on the telly, you know, all these sorts of obvious things. But perhaps when we expand the idea of home to the street, to the town, mm. to, the, to the area, to the country, to the nation, to the flag, these things also are emotional, are emotive. But how, how do we feel about the thing about home and and others? I mean, well, I, I, I might I might have a very different opinion to some people on that. Um, you know, as a um, fairly nomadic person, not in terms not just in terms of British geography, but in terms of my family and how much they've moved. You know, I have an my whole kind of history is about movement and um being in new places and 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 negotiating the you know do I fit here um does my family fit here does our culture fit here uh so yeah I, I come at it from a completely different perspective um but you know I think that where we get stuck perhaps in our kind of national discourse about others and and coming here and and, and fitting in and assimilation um you know it it feels like quite a false premise you know we are our nation is a product of global culture um you know how we live our lives these days you know ideas have migrated from lots of different places and and I, I, to, to call it one thing I think is problematic. It, I think we need to see the kind of the multifaceted aspect of our nature and, and allow people to find some space in that, as opposed to say, you are this, I am this, you have to move towards me. Um, I like to think of it as cultural reciprocity, as opposed to kind of, you know, fitting into the culture and assimilating into the culture. Um, and I think probably, you know, that's happened in with some groups of people here. Um, and I don't want to get into the kind of good immigrant narrative. But, you know, you've yeah. got that kind of cultural reciprocity that we've got, like, you know, chicken tikka masala, you know, however you want to describe kind of cultural contributions. Um, but there's this space carved out for uh, cu cultural contributions uh, that aren't con that aren't controversial, and I, and I think that that's that's actually quite a nice idea. That perhaps what we think is monocultural perhaps isn't long term. And uh, as an English teacher, of course, studying the English English language, you can see how non monocultural it is. Despite you know perhaps some stricter grammarians wanting culture to be disciplined in a certain way, certainly the words we use. I mean. I can't think of any bungalow, veranda. I mean, you know, things which are which are typically English aren't typically English. <laughs> no, and, and, you know, this is a part of my book where I talk about migration of language. And one of the things I'm fascinated by is etymology. And there's a section in my book that talks about the movement of words. And we tend to stop at Latin and Greek when we think about etymology. But if you take it back to Persian and Sanskrit and Proto-Iranian, there's, there's so much connection. So we're not even just talking about the loan words like bungalow or dungarees. We're talking about the word candle. Um, you know, coming from Chandler to Candela to, to Candle in English. Um, and and that, that migration of kind of a, a cultural, um, I suppose, a, a, a tiny bite of culture that ends up being part of our British culture, um, that being made visible to our students and to our communities, that's a that's a powerful thing to be able to say to people. Um, and certainly that's what my approach to it is. Where do you stand on the idea of the universal? I mean, this is one of the arguments um, about great writers 
you know, it, mm. it's the quality of the writing that matters more than the identity of the writer. And we could, whether it be Roald Dahl, which is an argument on both levels, perhaps we could have at some point, or Shakespeare or whoever it is, that Shakespeare speaks to a universal, but in itself, the concept of universal, of course, is, is up for debate in itself. But where, where do you stand on that? I think there are universal ideas and I think all writers kind of tap into that and we talk about kind of um, the kind of almost seven plots in 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 fiction you know you've got this kind of um, idea of storytelling across cultures regardless of where they are and and I, I'd, I'd have to challenge the idea that you know it's not important who writes the story I think you know yes there can be reference to universal ideas but uh, there aren't universal viewpoints and perceptions and experiences and you know when you only see universal ideas being presented by people from one particular area and I'm talking about perhaps white western Europe here um, that's uh, I suppose it's a cutting off it's a truncating of the actual narrative around those ideas um, so yes you know Shakespeare does in, 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 in embody some of those universal ideas but just take Othello for example um, you know he is basing Othello in kind of white Western Europe um, with a character that is othered um, and you then get the a, a very similar narrative by Afro Ben in Ar Orinoco um, and there's a, a completely different perspective um, and then when you have texts like Jane Eyre and then you get Wide Sargasso Sea you can start to see that perspective is really important the voices that you don't hear you know, that that's that's the the key part of this. That yes, the idea is universal, but the voice can change, um, and we bring with us uh, the ability to interpret that universal idea uh, according to who we are and according to our identities. And it's important to have that dialogue. Yeah, one one of the um, cultural theorists I enjoy reading a lot is Paul Gilroy, and he he talks about what's your end game. Mm. What where do you, it's all very well, you know, and and I think there's a problem with cultural end games anyway. Because mm -hmm. culture doesn't end, I and mean, that's the apocalypse. When it's, when it's over, it's over. You know, but, well, I think we didn't do. <laughs> but um, just just as a question, what's what's the end game with decolonizing the curriculum? When would you know? Or decentering? When do you know that you've reached the point? It's a very good question. Um, and I think, like you said, it's very dangerous to talk about end games yeah. because, you know, it, it's a it's an ongoing process to unpick the way we think and to unpick um, what we deem to be important knowledge and important texts and important um, political ideas. You know, we're, we're constantly in a process of flux with that. So I, I don't think it's possible to think about an end game with it. I think we can think of milestones and I think we can start to think about um, mitigating for some of the damage of kind of very, very colonialized thinking. Um, and, and we can start to bring in voices uh, that have been lost. But, you know, if I had a, a crystal ball and I could say, well, what does that look like in 100 years time? Um, I think I'd be making a fortune. Um, but, yeah, I'm not sure I, I'm willing to put something on the line with an end game on that one, Martin. <laughs> it's, it's, it's part of the conversation to at least have some sense of to avoid tokenism if if you like as well oh we've got i mean I, i'm not a great fan of black history month because i think it others i think it, it it's and and if that is the end game you know we've got black history month that that's kind of it that's all we need then then it's a problem on that level so mm -hmm. but it's also a problem on the other level in that to say yeah we've got to keep looking at curriculum looking at curriculum but what what's the balance we actually want to get in terms of the text we read um, as opposed to to the tradition of of English now what's what's English literature tradition you can t take away all American literature apparently and <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's fine you know well I, I wouldn't what about Irish literature as well you know and these and then if we say but we need more African writers who you know, then do you take away Greek writers? Do you do you? What about the Indian subcontinent? Is is it going to be? Um, we got a ticket number of, you know. Once we got a num, 
we've got to have 50% women, 50% men. Is, is there, can you quantify it in those terms? Is it, a, is it a tick list or is there more to it than that, that it's actually an ongoing conversation? I'm, I'm, I'm actually driving the question towards my own answer yeah, there. You're answering it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you worked that through. Um, <laughs> No, I, I genuinely, I mean, I, I, I think that dialogue, you know, your constant reflection um, when it comes to curriculum and what's in it and what's not in it, you know, that that's a, you can't, you can't set that in stone. You can't say that by this time you're going to have 50% women or 50% um, African, you know, you can't do that. Um, we're responding to cultural change. We're responding to the needs of our communities. We're responding to national conversations. Um, and you, you, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think it's pie. You know, if I take uh, a slice uh, doesn't mean it's it's of the curriculum doesn't mean there isn't space for other things how we bring in um a, a broader viewpoint and, and a broader representation and how we weave that into the curriculum that's the game um you know rather than just saying again here's a text that replaces this text um surely we'd be better off at looking at how whichever text you use fits into um kind of cultural narratives um and, and certainly i think again it's a bit of a myth about people who are doing diversity work or decolonizing work um that they just want to replace british texts canonical texts with i don't know whatever's been written five minutes ago um although i would argue for contemporary fiction being a, a real untapped um, seam of knowledge because you've got some really interesting perspectives coming out um, um, from young adult fiction in particular um, and expanding our understanding of what literature literature is in particular is really important to me uh, and I always say you know we don't do English art we don't do English music but we do do English literature and why is that because literature is a global phenom phenomenon and actually art curricula and music curricula tend to be really, really blended and globally aware. And somehow English literature is this kind of very politicized subject. Um, and I'm not sure it needs to be because if it was just called literature, well, yes, we would look at Irish literature and American literature without thinking that someone was losing out. And, and even something like Beowulf, which, you know, doesn't look like English to majority of students who look at it and first of all you know that's not english well <laughs> you know yeah, what is english i mean then you say what is english culture but but english literature itself of course has a rich narrative of radical opposition to englishness if you like mm. and certainly just in the irish tradition you know mm. let alone, yeah, let alone yeah. in the in the full col colonial tradition as well so yeah. it has it has an interesting space within itself but as a drama teacher you know i would teach no theatre, you know, which you know, Japanese theatre. Yeah, yeah. I, I would teach um, from uh, just because the story, even if you just take the Western tradition, it draws on theatre traditions further beyond the West be because of colonialism a lot of the time, of course, that, yeah. um, because of English history did go out there and did bring stories back, but also in exchange and, and uh, you know, it's happened throughout culture, throughout time. Yeah. And I guess ways, no, but I guess in some ways the thinking around it is that it wasn't that Englishness brought it back. It was the fact that you know the, those cultures existed in parallel to British culture as it was being formed in a particular geographical space, and it has its own merit. Um, and when you study no theatre and, and and the dance associated with that and the the costuming and the masks, you know that is something that deserves its recognition um, as you know a, a cultural phenomenon as opposed to um, something that influenced, I mean, we can think of it and it's good to think of it as something that influences British theatre, but in itself, it has a power. Um, and so I guess that's what I mean by decentering. that, you know, you've got that sense that, you know, something isn't useful because it necessarily like, informed us. It was useful, it's important. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one yeah. there as well, of course, because, I mean, Katakali, I, I did a course on Katakali, can you believe? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I find it hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and is it Cullery Pyatt? Uh, it, it's sort of, I, I, can't, I can't pronounce it. It's a, 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 I, no, I have no idea what you're talking about, Martin. <laughs> an Indian Indian martial art as well. I can't remember. Oh, right, right. okay. Cullery Pyatt, but Katakali, and I'm pro pronouncing that probably 
awfully. But but also that that um, now I'm going to use the word Oriental. You see, you see well, Orientalism. That's word that I wouldn't use. <laughs> no, but it's it's it was um, uh, uh, an essay by um, Arto who talked about yep. um, Balinese dance and and that and, 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 and I, I think you called it Orientalism and athleticism or something like that. I can't remember yeah, the, okay. the title. Yeah, but, the historical term, yeah. <clears throat> but because of my education, if you like, I come to it from the Western tradition. Mm -hmm. So even if I'm going to see Lion King or something like that, you know, Judy Taymor is coming to um, mm -hmm. her knowledge about things from a Western tradition and reaching out. Mm -hmm. We're always centred. So how can we decenter unless we change staffing change change um who who's doing the teaching of things to say this, yeah. If, yeah, how, how do we do it i think you know for me I, I talk about it as paralleling you know this idea that you have this one thing and there's this whole other thing uh where are the connections between them or are they completely different stories completely different narratives and when you give weight to two different um uh i suppose movements or uh uh, types of theatre or uh, types of dance you're saying well we've got this one in the western tradition and we've got this one in the Japanese tradition okay so let's look at them as individuals you're, you're then saying I'm not just focusing on um, the kind of white western European tradition I'm saying look there's there's a there's dance or music in its broadest sense um, and I'm trying to to expose my students to as much knowledge about dance in its broadest sense uh, by doing that um, but you know you, you it is a tough one, and I don't think there are any straightforward answers with all, with all of this. But teachers who develop their subject knowledge um, to include some of these kind of global narratives are are working towards that decentering without even realizing it, because they're referencing their they're bringing in those bits of knowledge that that students may not ha have at their fingertips um, if you know if we don't actually uh, bring it to them. Yeah, and and like you say, in some subjects that's it's, I mean, like maths, you can actually, maths is something that's drawn from around the world, you know. I mean, it's something you could actually say, well, this bit of maths that we're doing actually, you know, zero. Where did zero come from as a concept? I know? talk about that quite a lot. I also reference, uh, I think it was a kind of joke study that was done in the States recently where um, someone went out and said you know should we have Arabic numerals should we teach Arabic numerals in in our curriculum in the states and the overwhelming majority of respondents were outraged and said no um, and I think that speaks to the kind of ignorance around the history of the subject um, and I say that you know for our students they're, they're not aware of what those connections are um, and if we if you know when we when we do present them with the faces of the subject and the histories of the subject that is very much a kind of white western european history or, uh, or faces of the subject actually it, it's not an accurate representation of the subject um, an accurate representation of you know cartographers or or mathematicians or um, doctors has a rich tradition in the Middle East and, and, and actually we need to be flagging that up as um, an important bit of knowledge for our students. And just to <clears throat> wrap it up, I suppose, to some extent, because we've had a fascinating conversation. I've really, really loved it. Um, class, you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, some people say class is the biggest problem in this country in terms mm. of well, even if you look at figures on COVID deaths, you know, mm -hmm. class overrides everything, really, in lots of ways. Is is class something that we really do need to spend more time on? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, you know, I, I don't deny that it is a massive driver of inequality in, in this country. But I don't think that we can divorce the idea of race um, and religion from that. Um, and, and disability and sexuality and all of those things, because uh, ultimately you can be um, of a particular class and still less subject to discrimination than, you know, say, for example, if you are a, a disabled black woman. And, and I think that, you know, those things need to be thought about in, in tandem. Um, I, and certainly I, I hope that somebody at some point decides that they can solve the class issue. Um, what we should be thinking about is uh, why 
why uh, why are there disproportionate amounts of deaths uh, from COVID-19 from communities, uh, from BAME communities? Um, how does that relate to social inequality? How does that relate to economics? How does that relate to power structures? Um, and then we've got a really powerful conversation happening. Um, if we only think about it as class across uh, identities, I think we'll miss some of the really quite shocking statistics on, on um, the wealth gap, um, housing, uh, access to medical care. Um, and, and I think we need to be thinking about it um, as in a very joined up way. I was also reading the other day that perhaps a lot of the figures we get about class are actually not about working class, but are actually about free school meals, because it's the way we <laughs> measure things. <clears throat> and about a class, the precariat, if you like, people who are <clears throat> not working class culturally, but in a very difficult <clears throat> Sorry, I've just got a frog in my throat. Either that or I've got COVID again. <laughs> um, but but actually, the precariat, they're in precarious mm-hmm. position. The, the free school meals, you know, uh, the, the whole um, idea around that the, the, um, we've seen recently that the packages that have been sent of uh, an apple at a couple of yeah. rolls and uh, <laughs> a, a half a pint of milk or something like that for it to feed a family of 20 for seven mm-hmm. weeks or something you know l- ludicrous ideas and and to have but it is is class i mean when i was at school in the 1960s would you believe in 1970s i'm sure you would believe that never, <laughs> never. then then class was a was the big issue and we were getting barry hines you know and, and um, yeah yeah so kestrel for a knave would be the the reading material because you want to read because you're working class you want to read about working class people and things mm-hmm. like that um does does that work in such a way do we need a working class curriculum perhaps one that that is um more focused on the stories of working class people that's more centered on working class people that is less posh and is latin posh as a subject <laughs> no latin is fascinating i think anything that provides an insight into uh, how words are formed and how language works is is totally acceptable but I, I would argue that you're missing some of the kind of narratives around um the working class in canonical literature i think we've always had reference to the working class in canonical literature you only have to look at great expectations to look at that um so you know there is a grand tradition of kind of um uh, certainly Victorian texts that the kind of buildings romance style texts that you know are the, the triple deckers that take you through a, a character moving through society in some sort of way um, so maybe we started talking about it differently in the 60s and the kestrel for a knave but that had always been there and I would argue your perspective of your um, the, the preoccupations of your childhood were from your perspective and, and, and forgive me if I'm wrong but I'm imagining that was a very monocultural experience and and so, you know, you had, uh, you, you're more than, I'm more than welcome for you to correct me. Um, I have to now. My, my grandmother, <laughs> my grandmother was mixed race. Um, ah, interesting. Yeah, she's Jamaican and, well, she was, bless her. Yeah. Um, and um, my dad had, my, my, my uncle, on my dad's side, this is, my uncle has a, a dark skin and, mm-hmm. and my granddad, my granddad, my dad <laughs> had, had, yes. Um, has a, a much less so more my complexion but yeah, but yeah. had afro hair you know and I, but we but i i think we were very non-aware as as kids yeah. about this really and i think actually you know it's like i said about my childhood i wasn't aware as a child of my position in society and the national narrative and and you don't you go through your childhood and you accept what you're given um and it's only really later that you start to understand the consequences of that and and start to question it um and so you know what if in this magical world we're creating where the curriculum is is beautifully constructive and and representative and, and sensitive to kind of cultural contribution what if children are presented with that instead of something that looks very different from them um you know what what would they see in 10 15 years time you know I, I regret not knowing and not being told certain things I didn't learn about the Amritsar massacre for example um I didn't I, I you know a lot of Indian colonial history I didn't know um so the idea that we we talk about these things and we we make our children aware that there is um something of their histories in in the curriculum that we teach uh can only be a positive thing um and and I guess, yeah, you know, perhaps 
at the again i'm not casting aspersions martin about age um i'm, I'm saying that you know the 60s were a very different time um and we are more aware of some of these issues now um certainly the kind of uh more ref more defined issues so issues around sex uh sexuality gender gender reassignment um we have the equality act now so i think we are more naturally inclined to talk about these things and, and acknowledge they exist yeah and it's still it's still saying and i'm going to pick you up on this one word just just oh. just for fun but their culture and is it i mean how how fluid i mean talk about gender for a start <laughs> Mm -hmm. how, how fluid is culture and I, I i think it is fluid but it but we do have this need for identity as well which is static sometimes or needs to be more static to some extent and and still that there's ours we you i and 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 this 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 thing about identity mixing with culture which is it's out there yeah how, yeah. how do we how do we negotiate that i think that it's a crucial and very difficult question. I think, well, I mean, it's an individual choice quite often. You know, how you define your culture and what formulates your culture is a very, very personal thing. Um, and I think, the, the, like I've said, the difficulty is, is when you start marking out boundaries. Uh, when I reference their culture or, you know, children... Uh, needing to see their culture that is as perceived by them um, not because I have a fixed idea of what their culture is um, I didn't have a fixed idea of what my culture was I knew I was Asian um, but I kind of didn't really understand the nuances of East African Asian versus Indian um, and so my culture and my cultural identity has changed over the years and certainly my understanding of it has changed um, and you're right I think there is a kind of fluidity to culture and perhaps actually that is the gold standard you know, the, the the it's not a fixed moment in time. It's not a fixed definition, but the fact that people are allowed to define it for themselves is the important thing. That we shouldn't be telling somebody what their culture is. Um, they they get to choose, um, and then and actually, if we put the array of cultural experiences on the table, that's a much more informed decision about themselves and the society that they live in, um, as opposed to saying I need to fit into something. And actually, I don't quite feel like I do. So the importance of breadth. Absolutely. You know, I've always said diversity work is a, an argument for more knowledge, not less. Um, and, you know, when you think about it as a, a fundamental exercise in subject knowledge, um, that's when it becomes a powerful tool. And that's when it becomes a powerful uh, lever for social change. Um, and I'm just astounded by how many teachers are saying, I need to know more about X, Y and Z, because actually I've cut myself off and that's not my experience. So I've not read about it. Um, and that that richness of conversation, that's heartening. That's that's what we're looking for. Um, and the fact that we are having difficult conversations. Um, uh, the, the phrase is bandied about in diversity work quite a lot. And Hannah Wilson often likes to say it, which is um, be, get comfortable with being uncomfortable because this is an uncomfortable process, defining identities, defining cultures, trying to find out where people fit and, and how we can create space in our society for all of those different identities without thinking of it as a kind of replacement of that's an uncomfortable process and, and one that we need to go through. Do you know what? I haven't found this at all uncomfortable. I'm I, I just wondering now if it should have been for me more. Uh, I, I, uh, well, <laughs> culture, you see, this is, this is my, my lifeblood, if you like, discussing culture. It's been fascinating talking to you today, Benny. Thank you so much. Hold your book up again. <laughs> there we go. There, oh, there we go. There it is. There you go. So a must light. for every staff room. <laughs> every teacher. That's what the Amazon room. reviews say. That's what the Amazon reviews say. So <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm happy with that. I'll take that. It's been lovely talking to you. Thank you. It's been lovely talking so to you, Martin. Thanks for the challenging questions. It's not often I have to think this hard at five o'clock on a whatever day it is. It's I don't know what day. Time it is, no? it is, yeah, we've been talking for a while. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> sh shows you I enjoyed it. It's gone on forever. Uh, yeah, Thank you so yeah. much. I that's okay. And perhaps we'll speak again when all this is, all this COVID stuff is over. But this time, perhaps, perhaps in the same room, you never know. Perhaps. I know. When we see any, everybody other than just our families, that would be nice. Thank you.